So now it is my pleasure to introduce our closing keynote speaker, who is right down the other end of the room. So actually, you can come this way now, Richard. It's fine. Um, so I might have about seven and a half minutes to introduce him before he gets here. So Richard Charkin, I'm sure known to everybody here, a remarkable uh, publishing career from OUP to Reed to Macmillan to Bloomsbury. Um, I mean, quite, quite extraordinary. And, and a real um, ambassador for our industry and like, and like his own publishing house, uh, a true mensch. So Richard Charkin. Good afternoon. This is a pretty difficult session for a number of reasons. Uh, one is you're tired. Uh, secondly, there's a pub around the corner, I believe. Um, thirdly, uh, you've heard some really terrific, constructive, argumentative, helpful presentations, and you're not going to get one like that now, in all probability. Um, as soon as I suggested is free information a threat to freedom of information of course Chris Banks tweeted Betteridge's law which says any headline which ends in a question mark can be answered by the word no uh, fair point very fair point and so at that point I regretted the title um, so I went off and spoke to what I would consider to be knowledgeable colleagues in the publishing industry, because I am not going to apologize for being a publisher. That's what I've done for the last 48 years. God help me. Um, and I wanted to know what is the state of play on free information in the scholarly community? Um, and it became clear that there is little in agreement on anything. Is OA good, bad, neutral? We've heard a bit. Should academic publishing be totally free to the reader? Should this happen slowly or quickly? Should it include all academic information or just primary research? Should it cover all disciplines or focus on, say, key medical specialties? Are all publishers evil? Uh, are all publishers stupid? Uh, does that include learned society publishers? OA, do we want green, gold, purple? Should we have standard embargoes, whether it's archaeology or bioscience? Should it only cover government-funded research? What about Plan S or Plan China or Plan US? Is open science the real issue? Is it the structure of communication that is the real issue? So I spent these 48 years, um, and there's a bit of history there. Um, roughly speaking, it's a career <clears throat> defined by decades. Um, ten years at OUP, ten years at what became Reed Elsevier, ten years at Macmillan, and ten years at Bloomsbury, with a few uh, side shoots and the rest of it. Um, at the end, uh, what was it, about 18 months ago, I was 70, I think, and I stepped down from the board of Bloomsbury and my last sort of full-time executive job. And I now have a, 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 what's called a mixed portfolio, which involves many things, including not having to get up at six o'clock in the morning to go to a meeting, um, although I still do get up at six. I have various non-executive roles, and um, we'll go through them a bit. Um, but also, I wanted to set up my own little business. I've worked in many corporations, and I thought it would be interesting to be my own bank manager, uh, learn everything, do it without any full-time staff and without an office, the best way to learn. 
And being 70-odd, one of the things you want to look after is your brain and activity and learning. Actually, I learned something today. Did you know in France that people never shorten their first names? So Stefan over there is Stefan. He's never Steph or Steve. Uh, I never knew that. Here we go. Um, and if you look down that list, um, you'll see that I've worked in most forms of governance of publishing businesses. I've worked for two family-owned businesses, two who were owned by universities, one which was owned by a benevolent entrepreneur, one by a malevolent entrepreneur. You're entitled to guess which, which. One by a learned society, and two principally owned by pension funds via the stock exchange. Um, I think that's about the only sort of forms of ownership you can have, so I've tried them all, and now my own ownership. Um, in looking about this, you won't be able to read it, but that's from the Pergamon newsletter in 1974. And bottom right, it says, Mr. R. Charkin, now Senior Publishing Manager, Life Sciences. And this came about because they restructured. Have you heard of the word restructuring? It's quite, uh, quite common. Uh, they had been structured by product, book, journal, major reference work, and then they decided it would be much better to do it by subject area, life sciences, physical sciences. I think that's still going on. I don't think it improved things much then, and it might not prove things much now. Anyway, that was my time. Um, do you remember, how many of you remember that? Yeah, that's, um, that was a printed product on very, very light Bible paper which had photocopies, essentially, of the title pages of major journals. It was the first product of ISI, the Institute for Scientific Information, which has gone on through various things. The reason I put it up there is to do with free information. In those days at Pergamon, where I was Life Sciences Publishing Manager, we didn't have a lot of profit. And so we charged everyone for everything. For color printing of their plates, for redrawing their illustrations, for their off prints, we charged them. And of course, we charged the libraries as much as we possibly could in whatever currency was most beneficial to the publisher and possibly least beneficial to the librarian. But that's by the way. There was only one bit of information that we gave away free, and it was the contents pages of our journals. And it turned out that that was one of the most valuable things, and indeed ISI and its successors have grown very rich on the back of our free information. Incidentally, an aside, we did try to charge them, but lost our nerve. Um, so I moved on to Oxford University Press, very distinguished. But I was still obsessed with making money. Because at the time, OUP was close to bankrupt. It's hard to imagine today that that situation could ever be, but it was. Um, and I wrote, this is my only published article in a medical journal. I'm very proud of it. The journal in question is called Lancet, currently owned by Elsevier, and they published my letter saying that medical books were underpriced in comparison with everything else in the healthcare sector. So what this says is a UK medical book now costs, on average, £20. And I went to research what else a doctor might spend 20 pounds on, and I was given the following list. 
two bottles of whiskey, one shirt, a compact disc, do you remember them? A, record, a compact disc recording of Mahler's Ninth Symphony, 35 days of antidepressants, half an ultrasound scan, 20 litres of antacid, eight courses of antibacterials, one third of a consultant session, half a day of a nursing sister, and one outpatient attendance. Well, I think a book is pretty good value, and I still do. Um, time moves on, and with a colleague of mine called Vitek Trach, uh, I became CEO of Current Science Group, whose flagship project product was BioMedNet, and we still hadn't twigged about open access because our business model was to sell scientific papers um, and we didn't sell very many because the subscription model was still functioning perfectly well. However, we did manage to sell the business to Reed Elsevier and it was not that long after the merger of Reed and Elsevier and we encouraged them to put this brand new shiny business into Reed, not into Elsevier, because if it went into Elsevier, Elsevier would close it as soon as possible because they didn't want the competition. That's exactly what happened. And again, time moves on. And I joined Macmillan as CEO, and I think probably the most fun I've ever had was in working with Annette Thomas and a whole pile of other people to create something called Nature Publishing Group, which in turn spawned open access activities, and for a period anyway, and I hope still to this day, one of the most innovative STM publishers around. Uh, on the way, I did various other open ac access activities. There's uh, Aaron Kuster, who launched QScience.com in Doha. I'm on the board of the Institute of Physics Publishing, who have open physics. I'm on the board of Liverpool University Press, who also publish open access. It's very much part of our life now. However, I have some doubts about the understanding of the real cost of publishing. Uh, Oop, I've gone too far. Um, so here's a book. You could, call, you could call it a monograph. It's a very short paperback book. I commissioned it because I was wondering how on earth the United Kingdom had got itself into such a mess over Brexit. And is there some way of explaining that and indeed where it might lead? So I approached an author called William Waldegrave, who's a, a big, big panjandrum of politics, ex-cabinet minister, all that, and said, can you write it? And he said, yeah, sure. How quickly? I said, quick. It needed to come out. I commissioned it in July last year, and we had it out by September um, last year for the party conferences. Uh, and so I just want to do this little case study on costs. I didn't pay him an advance against royalties because he didn't need it. And anyway, I think that's a terrible waste. Um, copy editing cost me 250 pounds. Incidentally, I know these numbers because I paid every one of the checks myself, so you know. Typesetting and proofing was 500 pounds. The cover design was 250. Free copies, 250 pounds. And wait for it, the big one, publicity, 
£3,000. By far the biggest cost. By far. And then there were hidden costs, which thank God I didn't have to pay. The launch party was paid for by Coots Bank. He's the chairman there, so why not? I reckon that cost £2,000. Um, my file for the book on my computer contains 949 emails which involved me one way or another. Now, I'm not cheap and I'm not expensive, but I calculate that I cost about a pound an email. So there's another thousand pounds. Now, if you work in an academic environment, or indeed in many publishing, you treat yourself as free. But when you're your own, you really are free, but you better cost it out a bit. Um, what I haven't included in, that, in those numbers is the time I spent chasing independent booksellers to pay their bills, servicing the copyright libraries who claim they haven't had a copy when they have had a copy or they haven't and they've got two, whatever, hiring a studio for the audio book, building a website and keeping it up to date, making sure the metadata was appropriate, issuing takedown notices against pirates, all that, not costed in. So I, I have sold approximately 3,500 copies, which is not bad in the current climate, but it's cost me, and, and so I should say, that netted me 7,000 pounds after printing costs and all that, um, but then I had to pay the author, 25%, which is what I do pay, and all those first costs. So I'm sort of break even. But those of people in this government, for instance, with the UKRI recommendations that think monographs should be open access and it'll be funded by the agencies, they've got another thing coming. It's really expensive. Um, some while ago, well, in March 2004, okay, in March 2004, there was an all-party committee on scientific publishing in the House of Commons, I think. Um, and I, I and a couple of other publishers were on the witness stand, if that's what it's called, and I was asked, um, how much does it cost to publish a scientific paper in Nature, of which I was at the time chairman? And I got into trouble because my answer was between 10 and 30,000 pounds per article. That is outrageous, was the response generally. However, how I got to the 10 to 30,000 was simply by saying that Nature at the time had sales of 30 million pounds, and we published 1,000 art research articles a year. So if there's no more income coming, it's 30,000. But there is some income coming from other sources, advertising and things, so, so that's the 10,000. Not unreasonable. The reason it was so expensive is that nature did and still has a rejection rate of in the high 90s. The cost of publishing is not the cost of publishing the paper, it's the cost of not publishing all the papers you don't want to publish for whatever reason. Um, and what that says is that high standards, regrettably, incur high costs. And one cannot simply look at the day-to-day -day production costs of a paper. Um, while I'm up here, I'd um, quite like to challenge those who see STM publishing in particular, or academic publishing in general, um, as profiteering parasites. I know that's only in the Twitter sphere and intelligent people don't talk about it, but they do. 
there is an in, almost instinctive desire to say that publishers are stealing money from the academic community in one way or another. I simply don't believe it. Because most of my career we've struggled to keep our heads above water and have invested seriously in the industry as a whole. Without the profit generated by major STM publishers, we would not have had cross-ref up as fast as has happened. We wouldn't have built those platforms on which we all depend as quickly. We wouldn't have the intelligent debates we have now about open access and open science and all the rest of it and peer review unless there had been profit driving it, in my view. I'm, I'm going to open the thing to um, questions if you want to, but before I do, I wanted to throw a few questions at you. So, and I don't want you to answer them now, but please do think about them. And if you could insert the word really into these questions. So, do you think publication costs and time to market will really be improved by open access? Do you think open access will enhance academic quality? Are governments better negotiators than publishers when it comes to trying to reduce costs? Do you think one million authors paying $1,000 for each paper is better and more cost effective than 1,000 libraries spending a million dollars each? Speaking as a former credit controller, I know what I would prefer. Do you have more confidence in the newspaper Metro than you do in the New York Times? Would you have more confidence in a book published by Penguin Random House than one published by self-published Amazon? And here's the real one. Do you think, do you really think, that the dividends paid out by publishers to their owners, the owners may be learned societies, the owners may be pension funds, they may be families, that the dividends paid out warrant throwing out the whole system and introducing, as we've heard, levels of complexity that we've never had to experience before. Those are the questions I have for you. And you may think I'm being a bit sort of old-fashioned. Um, and to some extent, I am. Uh, it comes with the age. But I thought I'd share with you an example of how things have changed. Uh, in this 1974 Pergamon newsletter, which ran to 16 double-column pages, uh, there was one section that caught my eye. And it's there if anyone wants to check. It was headed, Miss Pergamon, 1974-5. And it was a competition to find Miss Pergamon. The prize was a weekend in Paris for two. You may choose your partner. It's kind of them. Um, you get a new wardrobe and you get some spending money. In addition, a titled sash, cloak and crown. There would be tasks if you were the winner. You would have to greet VIPs when the chairman, a certain Robert Maxwell, decreed. And you had to attend exhibitions on behalf of the company. The entry conditions were a photo of yourself in day, evening, or bathing costume and you had to share your vital statistics, hobbies, and ambitions. The judging panel would be all male. Thank God 
things have changed since then. I'd be very happy to take any questions, not about that, but anything else. Alicia. Right. I respect and admire you hugely. And I know we do not have Miss Pergamon contests anymore, thank goodness. But we in this industry have gender pay gaps of 10, 20, 30, 40 and above percent. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't think, actually, we can say that that sort yeah. of past is in the past and it's not something I, I think that is... Alicia, thank you. Joking. You're so right. Um, and I would add that... How do I say this? Um, I've been in general book publishing and in scholarly publishing. I, I don't have the stats, but I'm pretty sure the gender pay gap in general book publishing is lower than it is in scholarly publishing. And I think you make a very, very good point. On the other hand, for goodness sake, we have moved on. about the money that you are celebrating, rightly so. Mm. I, I don't think there is anything yep. wrong with the profit margin. But if it's being done off of the inequitable uh, returns for labor from members of our community, yep. from people in the scientific community, I think it behooves us as a community to be a little bit more open to those challenges yep. and respectful of the fact that there are people bringing disruption and challenge to, to us. And perhaps a little bit more humility in, in celebrating and engaging with those sorts of challenges. Um, can I just, yeah, can I, can I think that's triggered a really good thought. Our industry, if I had to, our industry, the scientific publishing industry, has not done itself any favors whatsoever and they ha I mean both in a positive and a negative way in a negative way they haven't dealt with their internal stuff as well as they should in a positive way they haven't told the world quite what the achievements have been and they have been enormous I mean, look, there's one thing I, I say when we first put nature publishing group online with with um, you know sales and all the rest of it, it turns out that the cost of reading an article in Nature fell tenfold to the users. And we still say in business, which was nice. But it was a tenfold saving. Now, maybe it should be a hundredfold saving, who knows. But what we did was economically sound and right and proper and help communication. We should do more. And I'm not suggesting we don't. Um, but thank you for raising it. Any other? Have I stunned you all? Normally Anthony Watkinson asks a question, but he's not here. <laughs> thank you, Richard. Um, one of the um, aspects of your career that I don't think you mentioned is your experience in China. I think you were chair of Bloomsbury China, right, mm. among, amongst yeah. other things. Um, so can you reflect a bit on the shift in global output over the last 15 years, particularly towards China, but obviously other parts mm. of Asia and the, and the rest of the world as well, and what that means or doesn't mean both for Western-owned scientific publishing, but also for research as a whole as centres of of funding and centers of power shift? Well, I, sitting on the board of Institute of Physics Publishing, um, the impact of China has been immense in physics. Uh, I think faster growth than in the life sciences, but I'm sure the life sciences will carry on from China. Um, it's strange dealing with China for many reasons, the food, I like it, but you don't, not everyone does. Um, the attitudes to gender, uh, the language, and of course the political system, which is very different from ours. But my admiration for their commitment to growth and their commitment to science in particular uh, is huge. 
How it's going to affect our industry, who knows, I don't know. What I would say is that they now carry a big stick. So many of our business, so much of our business is dependent on continuing relationships with China and effectively with the Chinese government one way or another. And I mean, I, I think it is not as stable a relationship as we have traditionally with universities and, and such like. So that's, that's, that's a, an issue. I think there's another issue, um, which is to do with language. Um, th throughout my career, if I ever prayed or said thank you to some other being, a god or something, I say, thank God I speak English. Um, and if we look back in history in the publishing industry, the European publishers adopted English and were able to be, become Springer and Elsevier and Bertelsmann and whatever. And in France, Hachette and in Italy, Rizzoli and so on. Um, China's finding that very difficult. And I, I actually do think it's a linguistic issue to do with the character of the language and the rest of it. And so, as a, in terms of peer review, we have now t an, another level of judgment. And how do we help them do it? How do we know we're helping them and not distorting what's coming out? I think this whole translation or non-native speaker English is a real issue. Uh, and more so in China than almost anywhere else because in India, you know, a lot of people do speak English um, almost as a second, first language. So um, I think language is a big issue. Money clearly is an issue. How far will China wish to continue to um, pay global publishers for publishing processes which they might argue they could do themselves. Although I would counter argue and say you're forgetting the marketing guys. Don't forget all the costs, which is what I tried to address earlier. Um, I'm enjoying my Chinese thing until recently. The, the virus is, is horrible um, and I'm not sure where it's going to lead. Uh, I mean, we can worry about the publishing industry. I, I actually worry about the world. It, I think we're not that far away from another recession of some sort or other, and this could trigger it. Um, on the other hand, what are the opportunities? I mean, that's, it's so exciting. Um, some of the numbers, you, you know, we've all seen the numbers. Um, in the joint venture that we've set up in China for Bloomsbury, it's largely general book publishing, children's and adult. Um, they, it so happens our partner has got uh, the number one bestseller in China at the moment. And, you know, compared with watching Nielsen book scan numbers of, you know, oh, we sold 130 last week, you know, we're in a different league. It's, it's, it's quite fantastic. Um, and they don't mind paying for the books either, which is uh, quite a good thing. So. Um, I think we've got a lot to learn from them. I think we've got at least as much to learn as, from them as they have to learn from us. In fact, I think we've got more to learn from them than they do from us. Um, and the only thing I would ask is that um, we, we don't fall into the trap of unintentional, I mean, you might call it racism, that, that somehow they are a yellow peril, for goodness sake. They're all, there may be 1.4 billion of them, but they're all individuals, they're all people. Uh, and we might not approve of every aspect of their political structure, but certainly they are people who you can love and enjoy and communicate with. Um, so I don't know whether that answers, I don't think anyone has an answer to China. All I can say is that Bloomsbury are delighted to have a, a, a joint venture in China at least for the time being. <laughs> Let's hope it becomes profitable quickly. The other. 
Yeah. Thank you. Um, it's a bit loud. Um, Pippa Smart, the editor of Learned Publishing. Um, Richard, you, you made the point that we, we have evolved, things have changed. But I'm reminded when you said that of way back in 2011, a Bernstein report um, of Elsevier, and this is, I think, worth a quote, said there's something unhealthy about an industry that has managed to alienate its customers to the point that they increasingly focus time and attention on how to upturn the industry structure. And I wonder, with your perspective over your career, whether you don't feel that it is time, you know, evolution will not work. We actually need something bigger, more structural to change. Otherwise, we are in danger of completely alienating our customer base. Well, I have to say I agree. <laughs> 100% with the quotation we have managed and it is really really unhealthy so the question is do, does one need a revolution in other words well, what would a revolution entail um, the, the big STM publishers destroyed would that that would be a revolution that's a sort of a Russian revolution approach um, or do they adapt well, they're trying to adapt. They're trying to evolve. Are they capable of it? Well, when we set up BiomedNet, the assumption was that none of the big guys are capable of innovating, which is why we did it and then sold to them because that's the way you do it. Um, and it's very, I think it's very encouraging. When I, when I see all the newsletters coming over into my uh, emails and things, the number of startups it's fantastic creativity. Now, some of those will become the uh, equivalents of Amazon and distort the market hugely. Some won't. Some of the big guys will survive. Some will have to merge. Um, they'll, they'll carry on buying each other if they can. Uh, I, I don't know. It's a little bit like natural selection. I don't think you can predict what is the right way ahead. But I, I accept your thesis that it needs to change. But I think maybe the change has to be an understanding of the one thing I, I didn't mention, but I think the biggest threat to all of this is a threat to copyright. Because one of the problems of saying things are free is you're devaluing them or devaluing their, their monopoly on that particular piece of information. And without copyright, none of this would work. Whether we have big guys, small guys, startups, the, the copyright is central. And I think that some of this debate about open access gets confused. That free, what's it mean? Free use, free, free money, or liberal, or what, all these things. And I think, I personally think the fight should be about protecting the rights of the authors to decide what they want to do with their copyrighted material, be they the authors or the funders of the authors or whoever created it should have that right. And there's a risk in what we're doing that we um, lose copyright because there are many people in this world, largely large tech companies, who are quite like to see the back of copyright, except of course where it applies to their own patents, may we. Um, so I don't know whether that answer, but I, it could well be that we need that revolution or the likes of, well, you know who, um, will adapt. And I hope they do, actually. Thank you. So, oh, um, hang on, I've got one more slide. Oh, we've got that's, uh, that's me amongst... Um, uh, academics trying to look like them and not be like them. It says when you're in deep shit, say nothing and try to look like you know what you're doing. That's been my motto in life. There you go. Great. Okay. Thank you, Richard, very much.
Thank you, Richard, for that. That's been excellent. Um, it's, uh, it's good to see that I think we've, we've had a, a nice element of diversity over the course of the two days, but I, we may possibly have overdone the grey-haired old geezers, but, you know, I've got a bat for my, my side on this a little bit and, uh, and keep those numbers up. I think it's a challenge to talk about the past without seeming to endorse it, and I think it's a challenge to talk about the future while cautioning against destructiveness and revolution, and uh, so that's part of the challenge I think we, we have as we look back on how things have been and how things might go forward. Anyway, right, that kind of concludes uh, the conference. I've got a couple of little things to say. Um, firstly, uh, to remind you about your surveys, I'm going to say it again, don't forget your surveys. Uh, you won't be able to get out of the building without handing one in to uh, the, one of the staff with a red badge or at the uh, exit, so please do that. Also, please return your badges. We reuse the badges, so that's a sustainable thing to do. Um, uh, it's not quite over because after this you have two uh, excellent options to you. One is scholarly social in the pub um, and if I'm looking for Bernie, where's Bernie? Bernie's there. If you ask Bernie where it is she'll tell you. Um, or there is an Alps event which is less free in one sense and but fr more free in another. So there's a, there's a whole rift there somewhere about whether you pay a fee to go to an Alps event or you pay the barman for the scholarly social event. But anyway, I wouldn't get into that this year. Um, Wayne knows where that is. He's just there. So you could ask him or ask anyone with a red badge. They'll tell you where those things are. Um, I want to thank you all for being here yet again. I look forward very much to seeing you next year. There might even be a slide. So... Um, it's going to be on one of those two pairs of dates next year. We haven't quite decided yet, but put all of those in your diaries, please, and make sure that you come back next year. Thank you all very much. Mm -hmm.